remarks and tell you more about um, Farm Biotrack and the preamble why we are assembled here today. So Dr. Kasimumba Tolo, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Master of Ceremonies. Um, there are Professor Bob Hopkins, uh, there are Vice Chancellor, a staff of Farm Biotrack present, there are students, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this public lecture uh, by Professor Bob Hopkins. And uh, before Professor Bob Hopkins comes uh, to the floor to give you um, uh, his keynote address, I would like to connect a few things from Biotrack, um, Bara University, Professor Bob Hopkins, uh, University, and a very important uh, institute which all of us must be part of, uh, PAVE. Institute, and uh, he will uh, most likely elaborate how all of you can be part of this. So, allow me uh, briefly uh, talk about Farm Biotrack. Now that you are here as a student, Farm Biotrack in full stands for Farm Biotechnology and Traditional Medicine Center, and it is this multidisciplinary center that all of you are welcome to make your contribution. Uh, what Farm Biotrack focuses uh, on is to turn our traditional knowledge, our heritage into money. What that simply means is that we have lots of traditional knowledge that we have. We have indigenous knowledge that we have and we don't tap them, we don't make them into money. One of them is herbal medicine, and which Farm Biotrack is focusing on, by training students who graduate with PhDs, with masters, and they come from multidisciplinary background where all of you can actually fit, if you are not yet, uh, part of it yet. We use herbal medicine in our settings, to treat different diseases, but in a traditional way. So in 2017, the government of Uganda with the World Bank, uh, they gave support to Mbarara University to put this center. And this center is host, the headquarter is hosted right here at the fo uh, fourth floor. Um, so we sit there, we support students, uh, we give them uh, scholarship, full scholarship, meaning they get research fund, tuition fee, and uh, money to attend conferences outside. Uh, not just only in Mbarara, but outside Mbarara in Uganda, outside the region, including the United States of America, where Bob Hopkins comes from. So this is a center that has been running using the money the World Bank gave to Mbarara University. Six million dollars, and we so far we've graduated quite a number of students. Those of you who attend the uh, graduation parties, you must have seen students uh, read uh, their profiles are read, supported by farm biotrucks. So those students came from this support, and now that initial support of the World Bank is coming to an end by 31st of this month, and so to have sustainability because all of you must eventually come and make contribution at the center. We established a known as Friends of Farm Biotrack Foundation. This foundation is incorporated in the United States of America and also in Uganda um, as a sustainability of arm of Farm Biotrack. Anybody, you inclusive, can give money or any support to this foundation and that is what we turn to give full scholarships to the students who will come to farm biotrack and study to graduate with phds and masters aimed at turning this um 
indigenous wealth, uh, knowledge, heritage of, of Uganda, of Africa, into money in form of herbal medicines, in form of other uh, natural products such as natural beverages, and so on and so on. And there are quite a number of these uh, products up in Farm by Track Museum. You can take time and go and have uh, yourself acquainted with. So the connection between uh, Farm by Track and Bob Hopkins giving you a talk uh, is uh, precisely that Bob supports philanthropic work. And uh, he's going to talk to us more about what philanthropy is all about. And so, being passionate about philanthropic work, having heard about Farm Biotrack and what it's doing in Mbarara, this wonderful work, having in mind or having established, having operated PAVE in other parts of the world in the United States, he says, why can't I go and do the same thing in Uganda where a number of young people will benefit and grow up with a philanthropic um, attitude? And this is what he's going to talk about. And uh, later on, uh, um, one of us will read the bio of Bob to you after the vice chancellor's address. And so we are happy that in one of our handing missions to the United States of America, we met Bob and uh, we talked about Embarra University. Uh, and also VC addressed this Uganda North American Association, a community comprising of several thousands of Ugandans living in America and, and, and Canada. So Bob also picked the interest to make his contribution come to Uganda, come to talk to you people, and this is one of the many activities he's conducting, giving you uh, a public address, which he will do in the next few minutes. And so at this point, I will give the, uh, the floor to the Vice Chancellor to address you before uh, Engineer Anke comes forward to read to you the bio of Bob Hopkins and we then finally listen to Bob. Professor Celestino, are you welcome? Uh, Dr. Kasim, Professor Bob, Bob Hopkins, um, Professor Tom Kong, Dr. Kasim Tolo, Engineer Anke. I don't know whether there is any other faculty here. They say all protocol observed, but I am protocol. So who is going to observe protocol? So um, many years ago, I used to stand and talk to students. And I always admire the, the faces of students, the expectations, and what they want to hear, and what they hope they will hear from either the lecture or from whoever is going to address them. And Dr. Kassim has said that uh, this talk today is not academic, right? So we are going to hear about what philanthropy is about. And I don't want to spoil Bob's lecture by giving you the definition of philanthropy. But my neighbor here, me and him, we have been exchanging what you can do with your smartphone. Huh? Uh, and uh, we have learned that there's a lot you can do with your smartphone. There's a learning you can do beyond the lecture. There's a learning you can do beyond the curriculum. And for us, the opportunity to hear from somebody who is not your usual professor lecturing to you about petroleum engineering, he told us he's doing petroleum engineering, electrical and electronics engineering, which other program is there? Environment? Biomedical engineering, computer engineering, human engineering. Is there anybody doing human engineering? Business? Is there anybody doing business? Yes, we have business people here. FCI. Is it called FCI? 
no that is uh, yes computer informa informatics and then uh, faculty of interdisciplinary studies do you have anybody from that faculty interdisciplinary studies no they are busy trying to connect with the community faculty of medicine how many people have come from faculty of medicine none oh you what program are you doing Master of Science in Pharmaceutical Sciences, and so on. So all these various, various, various fields or programs you are undertaking, Bob is not one of those. Bob is coming from a different arena, and he's going to try to talk to us. Now, I came, one, because I want to learn. And I was telling my neighbors that even me, I want to become an entrepreneur. I want to learn more about um, philanthropy. Over the weekend on Saturday, I was uh, officiating at the opening of a, a school up in my village where I come from. And after everybody have spoken, they said, now, Professor, we want you to organize computers for us. So suddenly, I am supposed to be philanthropic and look for computers to supply to the school. I could take money from my pocket or I can advocate from all of you I'd say I just want a hundred shillings. Does anybody have a hundred shillings in their pocket now? Okay. That's better. So I can ask for a thousand shillings from each one of you. Yes, because the, the nature of the economy doesn't allow you to have a hundred shillings in your pocket. So now what is going to happen is that I could use that and get only a thousand things for each one of you. And bingo, I have supplied computers to, to that school. So that's the nature of what I hope to learn. Now, as, the, as uh, Kasim said, I met uh, Professor Bob Hopkins in Dallas. I had gone to do my own things, and he also had come to listen to what the Uganda North American Association was doing in, in Dallas. Everybody from all over the world was there. And every Uganda of, of all sorts from the U.S. was there. And so, if luck could be expressed in, in, by other means, I think we were lucky to chance to meet Professor Bob Hopkins. And we, we floated the idea to him, can you come to Uganda to Mbara University? And he just said right away, yes, I will come in the month of December. And so here he is today. So we're very grateful that uh, that uh, invitation uh, was answered by you and you are able to come join us today and experience what we go Uganda. We will be able to uh, learn from you because I think it is Americans who also say you have gone through experienced something you cannot come out of it unscratched meaning if you sit and you listen to Professor Bob Hopkins there is no way you will walk away without having learned something so indeed all of us including me I am going to sit through and learn so when, you, when, I, when you see me there I am going to sit and learn Professor Bob don't worry, this old man has come to learn and learn from another senior colleague like you. So please, another round of applause for uh, Professor uh, Bob Hopkins for having travel. <laughs> paid his own ticket. He paid his own ticket. He's paying his own stay here. He's volunteering to come and share his experiences with us. You couldn't ask for more. So thank you very much. We are all ready to listen and learn. And I'm now I'm going to sit down and listen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Celestino Oboa, for those words of wisdom, uh, for sharing them with us. Um, we are going to not keep you in suspense any longer. So let me invite uh, Engineer Anker Weitzeit, who is the uh, Chair of uh, Business Innovation, uh, Farm Biotrack to come forward and introduce our keynote speaker for the day, 
uh, Professor Bob Hopkins, so Engineer Anker, take it over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today, we have a very wise Mze with us. In Uganda, you're often called Muzungu. I think you experienced it from the school you have just been. Our speaker this afternoon, we get to know him from UNA, Uganda, North America's Association, where the Ugandan diasporas meet. So, Bob, Professor Bob Hopkins, approached us and said, I want to learn more about you and about your work. I'm amazed what Farm Biotrack, what MUST is doing in Uganda. So after several one-to-one -one sessions with Bob, our team, Dr. and Professor Robert Tamukong, Dr. Kasim, and our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Celestino Opua, we, and myself, of course, become interested in your work and your you have written a book about philanthropy, so we are very in, in kindly show it. That is his own book. He wrote it about various philanthropists he has met in his life. We also learned Professor Bob Hopkins has a graduate with a degree in social entrepreneurship from New York University. He published 12 years a magazine in philanthropy in Texas. And he has influenced to create a new degree at University of Texas. And that degree is in philanthropy. It's not an easy job to create a new course in a university. Thank you very much. Our visitor, Bob, has been in Barra University for one week now. Barra Town and Barra University has visited different stakeholders, and we are real thank you for that. We had a meeting with the top management. We also had a stakeholder meeting in form of a breakfast meeting with various stakeholders, and Professor Bob was honored to be the keynote speaker and inform our wider society about philanthropy and social entrepreneurship. Bob has also the interest to start PAVE Club at the university. So he has that interest. And we are looking forward to have a formal engagement with you and your institution to make this happen. And this is the short bio. I googled him. This will be at least 50 pages and reading to you for two hours. And I leave you that. Professor Bob Hopkins, your floor, this is your floor now. And I'm inviting you to start sharing your knowledge with our audience. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For a moment, my name is Bob. Good afternoon. I'm excited to be here today. I've had a busy morning, and I'm going to show you where I've been. But first of all, there's a young lady up there that I saw come in with a paved shirt. Stand up. Stand up. Show us your shirt. I'm attention deficit. Do you know what attention deficit means? Okay. It means that your mind goes so fast doing so many things that you can do three or four things at the same time. Unfortunately, when you're throwing all these balls into the air, something will fall and break. 
Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Well, I worked for a private school in Dallas, Texas for children who have attention deficit disorder. Most of them are pretty smart. But their mind wanders. And I'm one of those kinds of people, my mind wanders. But my mind also will take opportunity to do a lot of things because of that. Which means I can't stop. I just keep going and going and going. And you see, I have been around for a long time, and that's the reason I can write a book that's 265 pages, just about my experiences in the world of entrepreneurship and then social entrepreneurship. How many of you want to be an entrepreneur when you grow up? Raise your hands. When you grow up. And you're some of you... Thank you. Dr. Celestino and I are still growing up. Okay. You know, um, when I was a little boy, when I was a little boy of six years old, and there's me in my book with me when I was six years old. And it's the introduction to my book. Because my life started as a philanthropist when I was six. Of course, I didn't know it or what it was. My mother, how many of you have a mother? How many of you had one and have one? Which means you all had a mother, right? How many of you had a mother that taught you everything she knew about life? Which means that she was my most influential person. And I wish she was here today for me to tell you about my upbringing and what I did. And I thank my mother. Now, I didn't actually dedicate my book to my mother. I dedicated my book to my cousin, who was two years older than me, who also taught me everything I knew. I just ran around with her, and she, she and I had so much fun together, and we traveled the world together. And unfortunately, she died 20 years ago of pancreatic cancer. And I dedicated this book because much of who I am was from Mary Martz. But anyway, let me tell you a little story. So one afternoon, my mom got me in the car when I was six years old. And we went across the railroad tracks. Now, that's not good in America. When you go across the railroad tracks, it's where the poor people live. Many of you may have been born and lived across the railroad tracks. I wasn't one of those. We went over there through the church. The church wanted us to take groceries during Christmas time to people who did not have a lot of food and didn't have a lot of things of any kind. We went to a little gray house. And we knocked on the door, and a little frail lady came to the door, and she peeked it open just a little bit, and we went inside, and there were three little tiny children who were kind of in the corner, huddled in the dark. And my mother took a big bag of groceries out of my hands, and she started taking things out of it, like a ham and a turkey and apples and oranges and different kinds of things to eat and pasta and potatoes and, and, and coleslaw and some fruit and different kinds of things. And all of a sudden, the children that were in the corner came out from the, from the shadows and wanted to know what was going on. And they saw all this food. And they started getting closer to me and they started smiling. And these kids having fun looking at my mother. And all of a sudden, light seemed to kind of shine in through the windows all of a sudden for no reason at all except my mother brought food to this family when we left and we were walking out the door and we were going to the car I turned around and I looked and the children were waving at us like this and they were smiling and all of a sudden I felt on my shoulder a hand and it patted me on the shoulder and said, you, good, you did good today, Bobby. And I didn't know who it was. Who do you think it was? 
It was God. I think it was God. And I learned from that day that if I was a good boy, I got a pat on my shoulder from God. That's what I have learned all my life, truly, is if I do good, I get a hand on my shoulder that tells me, you did good today, Bob. So therefore, I want to be good. <laughs> and I want that shoulder to be patted all of the time. Consequently, when I have joy in my life, it's because I have done good. And I love joy. And the reason I'm joyful is because I'm in Uganda today. And I love it. Thank you. Okay, so the reason I'm here has a lot to do with these people that we just talked about, these very important people of your university. And I accidentally, but there's no accidents in life, attended a conference in Dallas for people from Uganda. Now, the reason is not because I just decided I'd read the paper one day and say people said, gather from Uganda. In fact, three months before that, I didn't even know where Uganda was. But neither did anybody else in the United States. They'd say, ah, let's see, is that South America? No. No, it's Africa, and I learned that. Then I had a class, and I had a lot of people in my class, kids, and I'd go around the room, and I'd say, okay, tell me who you are and where you're from. And this girl said, my name is Pauline Bashabora, and I am from Uganda. I went, Uganda? I heard that about Uganda the other day. Isn't that interesting? And then I asked my students the first day of class, please write me an essay who are you, and why are you the person that you have become? And she, Pauline wrote this long 1,000 words and said, my daddy works for the United Nations, and he represents the Congo. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting, and lives in Uganda, and you live in Dallas, and he lives in Dallas, and you're coming into my class, and here is the name Uganda again. So I met Gaston Bashabora and his wife Rosette invited them to dinner because I wanted to know more about Uganda since I'd heard it several times and I thought maybe this is a place I need to be going. By the way, when opportunity knocks, you take it. And for some reason, God didn't pat me on the shoulder, but he ended up in my stomach and there was a knot there that said, you need to invite these people for dinner. And I did. Then they invited me to their house for dinner, and the next thing I know, I go to a big conference, and here is everybody from Must there. And I walked in and said, where's the university? And they sent me to you people, and I never left. I kept in contact with Anka every day, and we talked a little bit about my book and a little bit about who I am and what I am and what, do I, do, what I do. And she said, why don't you come to Uganda? I did. Not only did I do that, but I created PAVE. Philanthropy and volunteerism in entrepreneurship. But I already had done that in the United States, and I've been doing it for 20 years. So I decided to put together an institute, and it's called PAVE Philanthropy Institute of Uganda. And it's now an NGO. And I have an executive director, and he's not here today, but I do have one of my board members who is... Melanie Agagatu, would you give her a hand, please? And I met her through another person from Sweden, because I'm kind of connected around the world. Melanie is a producer. She's a director. She decided to escort me from Kampala here. So we've been together, and we're getting ready to leave here and go to Makasa, and we're going to Jinja, and we're going to several other places. What are you laughing about? Makasa. <laughs> oh. You know what? I really don't know where I'm going. <laughs> but I do know that I'm going to be a busy boy. <laughs> and there's four of us who are traveling together to go and spread the word of philanthropy. Okay, so where does philanthropy and social entrepreneur fit together? They're the same thing. Philanthropy is giving back. Social entrepreneurship is giving back. The social part is the giving back part. And the entrepreneurship part is when you own a company, 
where you're doing well or not, but you give part of your proceeds back to the community. That's social entrepreneurship. It used to be called social responsibility, but just a couple of years ago, they've changed that. In fact, I created a course in social entrepreneurship at the University of Texas. I went to school at UM at the University of, of New York, and I was able to put a syllabus together, and they agreed that I needed to do a course in social entrepreneurship. And then I just heard from you all, I mean, I was just told, and I knew this already because I'm the one who told them, is that because of all that, a degree is now at the university in philanthropy. I think we're the second in the United States. That means the second in the world because this is the only time that anybody has ever been smart enough at higher levels to realize that the heart is important in the development of a person. So what is must doing in science and technology even beginning to think that a heart is important in their work or in your work? Why do you think it's important to develop people and kids so that they are going to think about others instead of be me, 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 me all the time, which is what kids grew up doing? That's what you grew up doing. That's what I grew up doing until my mama told me that it was also nice to give food and clothing and concern for other people. How many of you go to church? A church. Okay, I know that everybody in Uganda goes to church. Every time I go to a meeting, we're saying a prayer. Am I right? Yeah. So I went to church. I grew up in church. I believe in Jesus Christ. But I have decided because of all of the wars all over the world, between the Muslims and the Hindus and the Hindus and the Christians. That I don't want any of mankind, which is what all churches, I guess, are trying to purport. And should churches be connected with education? In Uganda, you all think so. In the United States, we don't allow it. Unless you teach at a private religious school, where I do. I'm at the University of Westland, and it's Westland means Methodist Church, so I'm kind of connected with an organization like a church, but we don't do prayer in classes or anything like that. But still, I'm connected with Jesus Christ in some way or another. Okay, so social back to social entrepreneurship. Let me tell you a story. It's in my book. Everything I know is in by the way. 265 pages of my personal experiences about people and what they do in life to make things better for others. There's a woman by the name of Dolores McCall. And Dolores McCall is right here. And she's from Ireland. And I'm from Ireland too. I come, my ancestry comes from Ireland and England. And Dolores McCall is from Ireland. And, um, she was a secretary for a very important man from Texas who does oil. He's an oil catter. And I don't know if you know anything about Texas, but we're rich in Texas because of oil. Oil is what we've got. And one Texas is one of the richest states in the United States. Um, and anyway, she was the secretary to, and that was not her husband. That is somebody else who's also a friend of mine who's from Ireland also. But Dolores was the secretary for this oil catter. She married him. Five years later, he died. She didn't know anything about oil. She was just his secretary. So she had all these lawyers gathered around her because she had just inherited multi-millions of dollars. And she didn't know exactly what she was supposed to do with it. But the lawyer said, well, Dolores, the first thing you've got to do is give some of it away for tax reasons because you've got so much money that the government is going to take all your money extra in taxes if you don't give some of it away. And some of it away, we have laws in the United States that if you don't give it away, then the government will take it. So you've got to give some of it to charity, and then you get such and such deduction. You don't have that in Uganda. I'm not saying you should either. 
Because a philanthropist is a person who gets nothing in return of their gifts except the joy of giving. So in my book, there are people who are in philanthropy who are givers, and they may taxes, and they may get tax deductions, but I don't care, as long as they're giving back to help other people live a better life. What does that have to do with technology and science here at Must? Everything. Have you ever heard of um, climate change? Who's going to solve that? It's not going to be the heart. It's going to be science. It's going to be you all. It's going to be you graduates who go into science and technology. You are the ones who are going to solve climate, climate change and every other problem that we have in our world and in our atmosphere. And it is one of my biggest concerns. I have 16 more years to live. You have 75. You're the ones who are going to have to pay the price that I created, my grandparents created, my parents created over and over and over again by not paying attention to what we were doing to our planet. I don't know if you all care or not, but if you don't care, you need to. And you need to do something about this problem that I have created. And one of the ways you're going to do it also is the love of mankind. That's philanthropy. And if you care about your children, and you're going to have children, you better be caring about what happens to them after you die. They're the ones then or who are going to be overwhelmed by floods and waters and hurricanes and more and more fires that we have all over the world, beginning everywhere. And I don't know if you read the newspaper or know what's going on, but there's a lot going on in this world outside of Africa that is not good including the United States of America. We have floods. We have temperatures going up and down. We have the hottest length of time and temperatures in July and in June that we've ever, ever, ever had recorded in the history of Texas. And it's getting worse. It's not going to get better. So you people in, in science and technology have a responsibility. So what does that have to do with social entrepreneurship? Well, for me... I had better give the extra money that I have. And by the way, everybody has extra money. Do your budget and figure out how you could get extra money from your budget. Everybody's got it. If I passed a hat today and say put $5 in it, most of you would, would be able to do that easily. $5 is not a lot of money. I don't even know what that is in shillings or whatever you use. I'm having a difficult time with your money anyway. It's very difficult. Very difficult. So somebody gave, we gave a lady $50,000 yesterday. And I go, gosh, my gosh, she's not going to have to work the rest of her life. They said, I said, how much, how much is that? $15. I didn't even pay for lunch. So anyway, it is your problem today to figure out what you're going to do about it. And I'm saying it's social entrepreneurship, which means that you live, you have your family, you drive your car, you can even have a second home, and if you can afford a second home, you can afford 10 or 20 percent of your income to go to something that you care about. And pick it. It's in five different categories, or six different categories. The first one is your church. The second one is health. The third one is social problems that we have like drunkenness and people who have some sort of an ailment of some kind. The fourth one are the arts, dancing and singing in museums and places like that. And the last one is the planet. I give to the Sierra Club. It protects the lands and the animals of Texas. I give money to um, Greenpeace, which are people who are trying to manage our seas. Do you realize that the reefs of Australia are dying. Do you realize that the whales, the baby whales in Norway are being killed off as sport? Do you realize that the 
oceans are getting higher because the glaciers are melting, and it will affect you. It's affecting me now. It's affecting us in California. It's affecting us in, in Florida. There's not as much beach anymore. The sand is eroding because of the problems of climate change. So I give to Greenpeace. What are you going to give to? What are you going to give to? What are you going to care about? Now, what can you do today as students? A lot. You can get involved in PAVE. Philanthropy and volunteerism and entrepreneurship. We're creating a club here at Mumbada, Mbarada at Must, at your university. And we're going to be doing it soon. We have 15 of you people, men and women, who sat down with me for three or four hours the other day talking about what is PAVE. It's you. It's students trying to make a difference. So here's where I was today. I was painting a school with 20 students and 30 of the kids that go to the school, painting two classrooms that nobody can afford to paint that look like heck, that are terrible. I can't imagine a teacher wanting to teach in those kinds of conditions. And I can promise you, all over Uganda, you have schools like that. All over the United States, we have schools like that. There's a lot of problems in the United States. I'm not saying that you do, you do and I don't, because we do too. So you're saying, well, why aren't you back in the United States taking care of your problems, Bob? Because I wanted to come and see you. Because I wanted a vacation. Because somebody invited me. And because God told me, you got to go to Uganda. And that's why I'm here. It's because I'm supposed to be here doing this this month. And I'm taking my whole vacation doing this at my expense because you know why? It brings me joy. joy. You do something for joy, too. In fact, we're going to create an interchange between my university and this university coming up here, maybe the fall. We're talking about what we're going to do to do that. Anybody here want to go to the United States on an exchange program with us? You stay at my house. Just for a little break for a moment. Everybody, can somebody collect all of the... Oh, my... Melanie, where are you? Okay, so... Nafula Sharon. Where are you? You should be screaming. You get a chance to go around the world. Okay, so let me tell you about Dolores. I already told you she inherited all this money, so what is she going to do with it besides give taxes, which she did? And somebody said, well, she said, I don't know what to give to. And somebody said, well, you're from Ireland. Is there anything in Ireland you care about? She said, oh, yes, I love Ireland. I would want to go back to Ireland any moment now. I just made up that accent. So anyway, um, finally, a friend of hers said, let's go to Ireland. I have a college there that I think you would really enjoy. So she, she said, okay, I'll do it. So they flew over to Ireland. She had an incredible time. She went to a boys' school there. They were so nice to her and so friendly. She decided to give them a million dollars. You know why? Because she had it. <laughs> Do you know why? Because she loved the experience of what it was all about. And it was a nonprofit organization because it was a private boys' educational school. So she kept going back and forth because her husband was dead. She needed something to fill up this void inside of her, and she found it. Kind of like I found Uganda. This is filling a void that I had, too. 
to have an experience that I haven't ever had before, to people, to meet new people who are going to change my life, and to do things that I have never done before or seen and experienced. She wanted to do the same thing, and she had the extra money to do it. So, she kept going back to Ireland. She got involved in the Ireland Fund in the United States. She became on the board of directors in the United States. She had a purpose. She had achieved something that gave her hope. And it was through the nonprofit sector. And it was through what we call social entrepreneurship. People who make it big or small, but give a big chunk or a smaller chunk to something that they care about. And that's what the PAVE Club is going to do here at MUST. It's going to get involved with people in the community, create relationships, and see if we can't find a home for some donors. People who care enough about us at MUST that can give us some money so we can do extra scholarships or so that we can build extra buildings or so we can make this place better, or we can do something better with the trees, or so that we can give some of the people here who don't make very much money more money. You know what? Yeah. That's called social entrepreneurship. And so we can create social entrepreneurship here, and we can still solve the problems of climate change. I can give money. I could give to a project here that has to do with controlling the rivers and the climate change or anything else that has to do with this atmosphere to save this world. Now, it may be $20, which is not a lot of money, or it could be 200000 You just don't know what I've got. Now, what your responsibility is, for those of you in the PAVE Club and those of you who are in the community, your responsibility is to go out and find out who in, them, in your town has the resources and find out from them what would make you happy, what would bring you joy, and then you all have the responsibility of figuring out different projects here at this university that you can make an opportunity for people to satisfy that need of doing something for others. And it might be a university. Now, I have three universities I graduated from which I graduated. Two of them call me every week because they want to know when I'm going to be able to help them next. Because when I graduated from the university, and this is a custom in the United States, alums, people who graduate from universities, give back to their university in dollars every year, that we just do it because we want to help with scholarships for other kids who did not have an opportunity to go to college like we did. In fact, I didn't have an opportunity to go to college either unless I worked three jobs, and I somehow did it because I had to do it. I had no choice. And when you're a young man who's been raised in a definitely upper middle class family, you figure out a way how to go to college, the college that you want to go to. And I don't know how many of you are here on scholarships, or if you have to pay any money for it, or I don't know, but is there something about this college that you think we need that we don't have? And that's where the pay comes, come, comes in, and that's where you come in as, as students. If you say you're an entrepreneur and you want to do something good for society, now, there's other opportunities, too. You don't have to work for this college. You can work for a little boy that I heard about this week who's now paralyzed because he was in an automobile accident, and he's in India today trying to get treatments that you can't provide here, and he can't walk, and he needs care. And one of you has already talked to me about this boy in India and wanted to know if I could help. I said, email me, and let me see if I can give you some hope. Because at this time, that's all I've got to give is hope. At the moment, my money is going to things that have to do with Uganda, because we've got a lot to do. We've got schools to paint. 
And there were 10 students from Must today with, with paintbrushes, and I have pictures to prove it, painting two schools, and I don't even remember the name of the school. Madrasat. The classrooms are terrible. They are so ugly. I can't imagine a child going to that school. I can't imagine a teacher going to teach at a school like that every single day. It's awful. We only did two classrooms. There's 30. So that means that two teachers get to come back after Christmas to bright and shiny and beautiful and clean walls and an opportunity and an atmosphere in order to teach these children. But 28 teachers aren't. And it saddened me today knowing that we're leaving the school today because we got more plans, we got more things to do. But I decided as I was driving away with Dr. Robert today, we can't leave this school without the other 28 classrooms painted. We got to do it. It might not be tomorrow. It might be in June. It might be over spring break if you have one. I don't know when it's going to be. And maybe that's where the PAVE Club comes in here. I don't know, but we can figure it out. And I will stay around, and I'll be here on Zoom, and I'll be here on email, and I'm not going to abandon you. So I'm not one of these people that goes here and leaves you and then goes here and leaves you. I have decided since I, <laughs> since I only have how many years to live? 16. 16. How do you think I know that? Okay, here's what I have my students do. I have them write their eulogies. Do you know what a eulogy is? What do you want said at your funeral about you? So they have to write a thousand, no, 500 words, because not a thousand, because they'd be here, we'd be all here forever, a yeah, thousand words with 30 students in my class. 500 words, and you have to read it in the third person. Today we're here to talk about my brother Bob. He was so amazing, and he was such a wonderful individual. And here's what he accomplished, and this is what he did. They have to do 500 words about yourself, but you read it as if you're the third person. Say, so what did you do with your life? Now, you have 75 years to live. You'll be underwater. You'll already have your house burned down five times because of the devastating forest fires that are going all over the world. You're going to have diseases because it's going to be so damn hot. It's going to be 122 degrees, which is, I don't know what that is in your calculations, but it's going to be so hot that you're going to have to sit most of the time in a swimming pool that you can't afford. So there's no water in it. I don't know what you're going to do, but you've got to do something. You can't leave your children unattended in a world that they can't survive in. Nor can I. But I only have... Sixteen. Years to live. I really don't know, but... Um, I'm feeling pretty healthy today. I'm 80, and that's why I have 16 more years to live. I'm figuring... I can still teach, I can still walk, I can still get on a plane, but you know what I learned? If you ask for wheelchair service at the airport, you get to ride at the airport so you don't have to walk with all this luggage. So I did learn that as a new person who not, is not disabled by any means, but um, somebody who needs help. So that's social entrepreneurship. It's really simple, and you can start now by giving a little bit here or there, and besides it, that, it's not about money. It's about the time, it's about the effort, it's about the care that you give other people. Aristotle, 
said there were three artistic proofs of persuasion. The first one is ethos. Who are you as a person before I listen to you? What do I think of you? Do I trust you? Do I like you? Are you responsible? Are you able to be depended upon? Do you show up when you say you're going to? Are you nice to people? Do you lie? Do you steal? Do you cheat? What do you do with your life? It's called ethos. What is your ethos? Look at the person on your right. Look at the person on your right. Look at the person on your right. What do you think of them? Would you give them a thousand dollars and say, keep this for me safely for a day? <laughs> An ethos is about your posture and your poise. How do you handle yourself? What do you do with your body? What do you how do you look? How do you dress? Do you care about your clothes? I can tell you this, you guys look a lot better than my American students. You guys really look sharp. You're very poised. You're very postured. I watch you in my classes. I'm very, very, very impressed with what I see, doctor. And you know what? It's not just about their parents. It's about you university people and what you expect your students to be. And that's called ethos. Then there's also pathos. Blood and guts and sex and all of those things that have to do with emotions. We will persuade people because of emotion probably more than we will anything else. How do you think a six-year-old child gets to go do something that mama said no this minute, and mama changes her mind. Why? It's because the child stamped her feet. She screamed a little bit. That's called persuasion. That's called emotion. Blood and guts and all of those other words have to do with emotional part of your body. And then the third thing, that is part of the three parts of the artistic proofs of persuasion. And the third one is logic. And that's where you all come in on science and Come in on technology and come in on your faith. And what does the Bible say about it? And many of you throw Jesus at me all the time. Jesus said this and Jesus said that and try to convince me to do or not because of that word or because of the Bible. We in America use the Bible a lot. We use guilt and we call that logic. If you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. And if you come in late, you're going to have to sing. I make my students sing when they come in late. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Dear Christine, happy birthday to you. So social entrepreneurship is not about money. It's about your heart. Dolores found her heart through Ireland and the boys at the university. And she's a better person because she has joy. You need to find something, and that's called purpose. What is your purpose today? My purpose today is to teach you a little bit about a topic that you know a little bit about, not much, maybe to hear a little bit about a white man from the America and what he has to think and what he has to say. What I've learned is that we're not a lot different. It is so funny today, I was at this kids and all the kids wanted to feel my skin. I would feel these pinches all over my body. And I had a short sleeve shirt on. And then one of them came and then the next one. I said, what are you doing? We just wanted to feel your skin. And then some little girl said, are you human? And I said, yep, I am. 
it's a wonderful thing to be human and it's a wonderful thing to be um, on this earth for the time I've got. I live one day at a time. In conclusion, I want to say something really important. You all are in college for a reason. Education is freedom. Education is freedom. You all are here in this room because of, number one, you make things happen. Those who aren't here are watching things happen. And the rest of them side saying, what happened? Continue to make things happen. Keep in touch with your neighbor. Write down a hundred people that you know. Write ten of them a letter telling them why they are in your circle of influence. Tell them how much you care about them, not in an email, by a handwritten note. And give it to them and tell them in their note, and this can be to mama and daddy and sister and brother and aunts and uncles, and then the people across the street and then the people in your classroom and the people on the right-hand side of you, how much they make a difference in your life. That's the social part of being a good business person and a person who is a success in this simple, very short life that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bob Hopkins. Um, we shall have a session of um, questions and answers as we interact with uh, Professor Bob. Okay, I was just uh, getting uh, some information from the center leader about the rest of the programming uh, this evening. So after the question and answer session with Professor Bob Hopkins, uh, Farm Biotrack has a gift for Professor Bob that they are going to officially present to him here. And then later on, we are going to go outside for a, a group photograph. Everybody will take a group photo. But thank you so much for um, that wisdom shared today. In fact, philanthropy, like he said, it's not about money. We always think about giving, giving money. It's not about money at all. It's about the heart, like he said. It's about giving your time as well. It's about volunteering. We always feel like volunteering is... Uh, it's no option for us, but I can guarantee you it gives satisfaction and joy. For example, you can form a group of students in your class or faculty. Uh, every so often, you can volunteer to clean the hospital. You can volunteer to go to an orphanage and just sing for the children that are there. Just donate your time to do whatever you please. You can volunteer as a group of students to pick trash around the campus. I do that always. I can't go around and see trash on the campus without picking it up. You know, that makes society a better society. So don't just think about money. It's not about money. It's about giving joy to yourself and improving society. Okay, so thank you, Professor Bob. I have an anecdote in one minute before I give the floor for you to give Many of you have heard of um, this guy called Alexander the Great. How many, of people, how many people have heard about him? Alexander the Great? Many historians here probably know about him. Who was Alexander the Great? I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but if you don't have an answer, that's okay. Tell us who Alexander the Great was. Um,
it's on. Oh yes, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was a rich man who wished his wealth would be buried with him. Did you hear him? Who wished his riches would be buried with him, right? That's what you said. That's not too far from what he, he was, Alexander the Great. Those of you who know about ancient Greece, the Greek Empire, the king of Macedonia, in fact, at the age of 30, he became one of the wealthiest persons in the whole world. And he has, up till date, been one of the greatest commanders of the biggest army in the world. He conquered from Egypt all the way to the point where everybody feared him in the world. He had all the riches that the world needed. But what happened? At the age of 30, he went to the battlefield and fell very sick. When he fell sick, he knew he was dying. But he had all this wealth amassed. So what did he do? He called his personal attendant and said, I have my three dying wishes that I want to share. This when I die. He said, when I die... I want my body in the coffin to be carried with my hands hanging outside of the coffin. Weird. And I'll tell you why. Something is wrong with the microphone there. Finally, he said, when I die, the second wish is that all the doctors in the whole wide world with my money, buy them. They come up gear possible. And then they parade me along the street and accompany me. dying wish was all the wealth that I have accumulated, I want you to pour it on the streets so that the world would know that a rich person has ever existed. Now, you may ask why. What is the rationale behind his wishes? One, my hands hanging outside of the coffin to show the entire world that I came into this world with empty hands and I want the world to see that I'm going away with empty hands. What a great lesson. Number two, he said all the doctors should accompany me with all their gear so the world should see. What does it mean? Even with all the money that I had, the greatest doctors in the whole world, my money could not buy them to save my life. Third dying wish, pour that wealth on the ground so that everybody in the village would be able to trample on that wealth, on the gold, to the grave. What does that mean? He simply meant that everything that we have is vanity. We do not own anything. So whatever we hang on to, be it your time, be it your assets, be it your wealth, we do not own anything because at the end of the day, Everything is going to pass away. You're not owning it. On that note, I really sincerely want to thank Professor Bob Hopkins for his great heart. He's giving everything that he could to make the world a better place because he knows, not like Alexander the Great, that he does not own anything. All he owns is for the greater happiness of humanity. So thank you again for that. Now I'm going to open the floor for questions and answers. Let's limit that. Maybe we take all the questions and then Professor Bob would be able to answer at once. The winner.
Oh, another winner. Katunjie Douglas. Another winner. Can you come forward, please? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so while we get questions and answers, maybe Professor Bob, um, for the benefit of time, maybe we take down all the questions and then answer them at once, if it's okay with you. So here is a pen and a paper for any question, so that you can note that and at the end of the uh, answer and question session. So just so you know, research has been conducted those that give anything in the world for free or to make other people happy have a lower blood pressure than many people. They have a better quality of life. They have better social interactions. And they have a longer lifespan than people that don't give. It's been proven. Okay? So any questions for Professor Bob? We will take about five questions for that matter. So we your name, your faculty, and your year. Thank you very much. My name is Kobsinger Grace. Uh, I'm a student here. I do petroleum engineering and environmental management from the Faculty of Applied Science and Technology, this very faculty. Um, my question is to Professor Bob. I would also like to thank you for your presentation and for letting us learn from you. So um, I'm a president of a club here in Must that does more of what PEV wants to do. I'm a Rotaract president for this year and we mainly do um, philanthropy. We move around, uh, do needs assessment to see who in our communities is vulnerable, who needs help in any way, and admired of other activities. Um, however, we've gotten a challenge of having to seek for funds. Being an institution-based club, it is very hard for students to give a little of the money they get from their parents, their pocket money, and put it into a fund that directs it to, the, to address the needs of the community. So I'd like to know if in your experience there are other ways or tips that you can help us with in which we can secure probably funds or grants from various organizations that can help us run these clubs and help advance the philanthropic work that we do. Yes, because that is one of the main challenges that we face as a club here. Okay. She says she belongs to a club here at Mbarara University called the Rotary Club. And they do similarly what PAVE does in terms of philanthropy. But being students, they find it challenging to contribute financially because of their limited resources. So what she's asking is to know whether there is a way students can leverage their limited resources and their ideas in order to get money that would support their activity in your experience. I know Rotary really well. I know Rotary really well. Rotaract. Rotaract is for teenagers, university students who want to do something in an already established organization. It's fabulous. It's all over the world. Congratulations and thank you for being there. Yes, ma'am. Let me tell you this. 
I've got 28 classrooms that need to be painted. Hello? I've got 28 classrooms that need to be painted. Rotaract could do that. The PAVE Club could do that. You could do it together. You could do it on a Saturday. You could find somebody to donate the paint. Yes, the paint costs about $500 for three classrooms. Where are you going to get $500? Do you ask somebody to help? You make a list of 100 people that you know, and you ask 10 of them for a contribution for paint for a school on the other side of town where it, the conditions are terrible. Just an idea. You could paint this school. How many of you like to paint? I love to paint. You should have seen the little kids painting over there today. We could do it on a Saturday. I could do it by Zoom. Is that an idea? Yeah. That's think out of the box, and I'm giving you something that I decided to do today. Okay, here's another idea that you can do, is you can donate, ask people to donate some money so that you could make cakes for the elderly or to the people in the hospital. Or you could go on visits with people to the hospital to see patients or old folks. Yesterday, we went up into the mountains to where there were no people, and we took um, school materials for kids because they don't have any materials. They don't have any pencils. They don't have any papers. We tried to figure out how to do that. You could do it through your church. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Bob. Any other question or comment from the audience? Okay, we have one there. Your name, your year, and the program and faculty. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Alega Sailors, offering procurement and supply chain management. I'm from the town faculty. My question is more of out of a curiosity. Many people do what Mr. Bob does, philanthropy, but his is kind of unique because he's talking about big amounts of money, according to us, $50,000, $15,000. Now, my main question is, do you have someone behind you supporting you financially, or it's you that is helping us out? I have friends. That's an easy answer. I have friends. Okay. It costs a lot of money to come here and doing all that we do, and I'm paying everything my way. I'm at 100%. I'm paying. Next time I come back, I'm not going to. You're going to pay. Because I'm going to teach you after this session is over, if anybody wants to stay, and I'm going to talk to you people in the PAVE Club how to raise money, how to create relationships with people and raise the money that you need to raise. Here's what I did. I have a circle of friends. And 15 of those raised $14,000 from 15 of my friends. One of my friends gave me $5,000. One of my friends gave me $2,000. And I just asked him today to send me another 1000 please, because I need more shirts and more hats because I'm giving them out like gravy. Is every to other cities, and I need to have more shirts and hats. I haven't seen that he sent me the money or not, but he can sell it to me. Then I have another friend who gave me another $2,000. Then I have a friend who gave me $500. And then I have a friend who gave me $250. And then I have a friend who gave me $100, $100, $100 times 10. And a cousin of mine who's living in a trailer out of the blue gave me $100. I don't know where he with people who care about me that I give back to when they ask me for something. And I showed them pictures of you all and the kids. But 
about this for a while, and you tell people, and then when you do it, that trip I was talking about, do you know those kids I was talking about? Do you know that classroom that I have to paint? Now's the time. Could you give me some funds? And you have create a plan of giving. Now, in this situation, I didn't ask anybody for any amount. Gigi inherited a lot of money from her mother, and her job is to give it away. So I called Gigi, and I said, I need $1,000 for the hats and the shirts. Bob, I love those hats and those shirts. I think those hats and the shirts are so great. Then I didn't hear from her, and then I didn't hear from her, and then I didn't hear from her. And finally she said, okay, Bob, how much do you need? And I said, as much as you can give. And she said, I'm going to give you $5,000. It's your friends. It's your acquaintances. Oh, and by the way, I hang around with people who are smarter and better than me. I do not hang around with people who are pulling me down, who never can keep a job, and who don't go to college. I only hang around with people who go to college because, you know what, I want people smarter than me, too. I pick my friends very wisely. And some of you I've already picked that I'm going to keep in touch with. And one of the guys heard about me. He's seen me. He's talked to me. He called me this morning, and he said, I like what you have to say. I want to know more. Are you here, you person who's been talking to me about wanting to talk to me about con entrepreneurship? Anyway. I could be, this person here, I could be a good friend of yours. All you have to do is come and take my card. My cards are down here. Card, contact, email me, and I promise you 100 respond. Anyway. Thank you very much. Um, we have, let's have... Uh, Let's keep it brief. It's about five o'clock already. So we have one, two, three, four, and then the last person here, five. Let's start with the gentleman here. Your name, class, faculty, and year. Um, thank you. I'm Innocent Mukoli. I do software engineering, that's FCI. Yeah, I'm a student. So my question is, at the start of your story, there is you being the person that lives on this side of the rail road or something. Now that's a common part of everyone's story almost in this room. Grace is the president of a Rotaract club because sort of she comes from abundance. She's not lived on the other end so she can easily Oh, yes. Yes, so she can easily look back and, and uh, strive for a pat on the back as a reward for giving, yeah? It's not the same case for people that come from the other side that strive to, to make it. That's why most of them, or not even most of them, but they, they don't have the whole, the whole, they don't look for kicks in giving, like, this gives me the kicks, let me do it. Like, You give because it gives you the kicks. It makes you happy. It gives you the joy. That's not the same for people on the other end. So my question is, if I'm from this end, whereby I am the end to be given? Does it, so, oh, sorry. Does it ever make sense for for you maybe preaching a certain way of like even at like the smallest the smallest levels even when you are struggling the most and you're able to give thank you That's how possible is it for someone who is
You don't have to have any money. You don't have to have any money. You don't have to have any money. Everybody say that. You don't have to have any money. You have to have a heart. And you open up your heart and let the love shine in. There's a song. Open up your heart. Anyway, there is a song about that. And you are good to people, and the more good you are to people, it'll come back to you tenfold. And sometimes it'll come back to you in money. I carry a $2 bill in my wallet because I heard a long time ago, like 25 years ago, if you carry a $2 bill in the United States in your wallet, it will attract more money. Isn't that crazy? You know what? My wallet is never empty. Why is that? It's because of my attitude and behavior about money. I am not ever going to be without because it's my attitude. It's my behavior. Those in your mind, if I don't do such and such, I will fail. Let's not go to the movies. We can't find a parking place. Don't go over there in my rain. Your behavior, it's your attitude, it's your feeling about who you are as a person. It will come. And you know what? You look like the guy who just asked that question. You look like a guy. Are you? That's the question? Yeah. You look like a guy doesn't need money. All right. What about Jesus? Do you all trust him? Do you like him? Do you trust him? Is he trustworthy? Is he honest, courteous, and kind? He's saying yes. Nobody else is saying anything. You don't need money. Another question. Some questions at the back. Oh, microphone. Let's be very succinct, please. She's going first. The other three. My name is Ninsima Anameri. I'm in third year doing biomedical engineering at the Faculty of Applied Sciences and Technology. First of all, I'd like to thank you for spreading love to MUST. It's really beautiful. And my question is, do you assess the impact of PAVE? And if you do, how do you do that? All right. Uh, let's ask the questions. We shall answer them at once. Do you Repeat your question very briefly. Do you assess the impact of PAVE and how do you do that? Good question. Not everybody is a leader. And I go to, though, however, sometimes the, the schools that are the worst. And I take college students, smart ones like you, and we teach standing up in a circle. And we hold on to the kids who can't seem to stand still. And we talk about giving and philanthropy and all those things that are part of our program. Then we go outside and we pick up trash. And the mothers call and say, what are you doing having my child picking up trash? I sent him over there to learn to read and write. And the principal says, and that's the only thing that your kid is good at, is picking up the trash. But you know what? Picking up the trash has changed his life. So the first time we had 15 kids walk across the stage at the end of school, and the teachers would say to me, what did you do to these kids? Every one of them have, will change. Every one of them will change. One of them that I had when he was 10 years old is now 25, and he's the president of my foundation in the United States. Not every kid does that. 10% of the world are leaders, and the rest are not. 
So those of you who come to PAVE will potentially be one of those 10% leaders because we teach you the qualities of being a leader. But you're right, not every kid is the same. So you will have failures. And again, not everybody's a leader. So hopefully, if you've had PAVE, you probably have a better chance. That's what I'm thinking. Um, good evening. My name is Conquinda John, doing biomed a bachelor's in biomedical engineering. I wanted to ask uh, how, if you can expound on impact investing and if philanthropists should consider it. Impact investment means. I guess I don't know what impact investment really it means. What does it mean? Impact investment. I don't know what that means. Is it a terminology in economics? Well, I, I heard about it in the field of philanthropy, and they were talking about uh, deployment of funds into investment funds. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe I got that now. So anyway, how do you know that if you give money to something, it's going to succeed or not? If you give money or you give time to something, how do you, are you guaranteed it's going to be a success or not? Is that right? Is that impact investment? I think that's what you're asking. Is it Say yes or no. Okay. I think you take a chance. <laughs> I think you do your research. I think you give to those things that have a proven record of success. Just like when you get married in the possibility that things are going to work out, and if they're not going to work out, whose fault is it? It's a, it's a bad decision or not or something like that. I give to those things that work. I do research. I want to know who's on the board of directors. I want to know what have they done the last year. I want to see their financial reports. And by the way, philanthropy is different than being an entrepreneur in making money. When I give something, it's takes me to going to invest in a business that is for profit. I do want to see the financials. So I think there's a difference here. Those of you who are social entrepreneurs, you're going to give to the things that you think from the heart are going to be good for you and are going to bring you joy. If you're going to invest to make money so that you can buy another Cadillac and a home, then that's a whole nother ball game. So there is a difference. And I do thank you for answering, asking that question because it's really important that you understand what you're given to and where their money's going. If you ask me for money for the heart, I like you. People give to people who have a good cause in philanthropy. In for-profit business, people give to people who have a proven record. There's two things here. It's the heart. That's a great question and thank you for answering that or asking that. The next person. I'm being informed that we are cutting into the time of, uh, there is a worship session here at five. So we are cutting into their time. So let's make it as brief as possible so that we can conclude. So let's get the next speaker with your very brief question. And then while he's preparing to ask, we will have the final comment from, um, I want to recognize the presence of uh, Mr. Dennis Lukaya, who is the, uh, he's the administrator of the Faculty of uh, Biome not Bio Applied Science and Technology here at Barara University of Science and Technology. And he's our former public relations officer, very soft-spoken, Good public speaker and very prolific in what he says. 
So we shall have um, a final comment from him after you. Thank you. You're most welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Buyinza Hamidu. I'm in my final year doing petroleum engineering and environmental management. Personally, mine is also a comment, not a question. I want to warmly appreciate Mr. Bob for this insightful session. Actually, like, it was almost about me because like, personally, I've been facing this. I'm also I'm, I'm like a victim of this. I've always been getting excuses of not giving. Like, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. And I will tell you, you will never have enough to help anyone. I know people that are earning a lot of millions, but they are not like, willing to go down to someone who maybe needs their help. So it's not about have earning a lot of whatsoever, but it's about the spirit of giving. Personally, like what I've learned from here, and what the lesson is that I'm, I've learned from here, I'm promising you that I'm going to go to my community and implement these things. Like for example, <laughs> like for example, this coming academic year, I will go to my village, like to my primary school, and at least I'll try to find or give scholarship to a student every year to my primary school. I'm going to start small and I'll fill up this so that maybe I can also expand and maybe bring it up to campus level. Thank you. He appreciated the initiative and said he had never realized how far reaching philanthropy is and people feel you only have to give when you have money but for him he's changing his life transforming this time around he's going to his little village and he's going to offer a scholarship to one primary school children in memory of this lecture today you know it's an interesting thing the proceeds from my book the proceeds from my are all going to a scholarship in the name of one of my teachers in high school who was my speech teacher. So yes, that is a great idea. I love scholarships, and thank you very much for doing that. All right. Mr. Dennis Lukaya, it's our singular pleasure to have you uh, say a word and your remarks before we proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much much uh, uh professor robert tamkong professor bob hopkins thank you for coming to uganda i am particularly very proud for what you have said this afternoon and i know you have been around saying some very good things It is only politicians that give, but when they give, they do not give for free. They give so that you may give. It is only those that are interested in mankind, like you have rightly said, that make this world a better place. Giving is moral. It is just the right thing to do. But you must give with the passion, the interest to make better for wherever you are giving. At uh, the Faculty of Applied Sciences, we try in our local way to also give. We try, we help, we support. And it is not for anything. It is that we all can remain members of the same family. I thank you for coming. I thank Farm Biotrack very, very much for enabling and uh, providing you with all the necessary um, uh, contacts here to come. We have a lot of land in Kihumuro. I don't know if the Vice Chancellor is still present. We need to find a small piece so that you put up a summer house. So that you know that when you come to Uganda, you are definitely going home. 
Thank you very much, and may God bless you, and may the work of your hands continue to make this world a better place. You rock, Professor Bob Hopkins. Thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dennis Lukaya, for those kind words to Professor Bob. Without any further ado, let me invite Dr. Kasim Mbatolo, the center leader for Farm Biotrack, to present a gift of appreciation to Professor Bob. Dr. Kasim. Yeah. <sighs> Professor Bob, one more time, allow me to say thank you very much for inspiring every one of us here today. And I think this is, in my opinion, is a life-changing uh, session for most of us. As you, you could have heard a few minutes ago, one of our dear students testifying that giving, we don't need to wait. We can actually change lives in, in, our, in our own ways. And you rightly said, it doesn't have to be big. It can be big, that's good, but also small is good. It should come from the heart. So we are very grateful. And I hope this is not the first and the last you are addressing us. You've rightly heard from our own uh, Mr. Lokaya Dennis that we have behind Chumoro Hill a very big space uh, over, overlooking the Harbour Garden. Always refreshing. We want to put a, a summer house for you there so that you will come every year and uh, talk to these nice people. We are very, very grateful for your time. This is the philanthropy in action because you are doing this not for pay, it is just for humanity. Uh, to show you our appreciation in a very humble way, the Farm Biotrack team on behalf of the university has a very humble gift here which is uh, put in this, in, 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 in this small uh, carrier. We would like you to go with it to the United States of America and uh, have it shared among your friends who supported you to come here and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay. All right. So we want to close the session by thanking you for taking up time today to be here. We are really appreciative. And hopefully, let me end with this African proverb. If you think you are too little to make a difference in the world, then you haven't slept with the mosquito in the same room. That's an African proverb. As little as the mosquito is, when you spend the night in the same room with the mosquito, then you would understand how little, a little can make a difference. Does that make sense? On that note, God bless you. Have a good evening and we go out for a group photo. Thank you very much. Watching a hit TV empowering you.